thank you for coming and for being on time. We're going to start, I'm going to start with a little bit of a housekeeping and a little bit of an intro for you, we Harp, and then I'll introduce Dr. Bess, who's our featured speaker today on fighting fibroids. All right, so a little bit about UB Harp. Um, we are the HIV program on campus, but we broaden into larger sexual and reproductive health topics. And this is the second year we are offering the S Files discussion series, where we'll be focusing on sexual and reproductive health. So at UB Harp, we seek to positively influence the sexual and reproductive health and wellness of the university population and the wider Caribbean society, and I see some of our off-campus partners here, welcome. Our primary focus is the development of sexual health literacy then among the community, and we do this through interdisciplinary research, sexual health, capacity building, and sexual reproductive health and rights advocacy. And we do this through um, four main um, through four main branches, through condom distribution, which we offer free of cost from our office, as well as sexual health education, advocacy, and outreach, which is uh, part of what we're doing here today. Yesterday, we had the breast screening, uh, pop-up breast screening mobile unit here on campus for staff and students as part of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So that's part of our outreach and advocacy, as well as HIV and sexual health research and uh, we support with the Student Health Clinic as well as the Ministry of Health um, STI testing on campus for students, and this is of all nationalities, free of cost in, in the clinic. Um, just a couple of things to be mindful of um, in our S-Files discussion. It's a, what we aim to do is to create a safe space to address a range of sexual health topics using, as far as possible, sex-positive language, couch, of course, in respectful and responsible behaviors. So um, we would alert you that you might hear a range of views you might disagree with. Please be respectful of others' views, although they may differ from yours. Also, we cannot guarantee confidentiality in a group. Be cautious about what personal information you disclose about yourself and others. It's safer to talk in general terms. Any of us in the group may be living with HIV or another STI with or without our knowledge of our status. Additionally, anyone in the group could be homosexual or have had, or have had a pregnancy, termination, um, abortion, miscarriage, or experienced infertility. Please be conscious in the way we discuss these sensitive topics, regardless of religious or moral beliefs, taking care to talk in ways that we do not, that we do not discriminate or alienate others. And be mindful of UB Harp's guiding principle, first do no harm. I'm gonna ask that you please don't take photographs or film the talk. We will have EMS here doing it for us and we are very grateful um, that Joel is here. And then you will see um, Brian, he will come to take photos. Uh, this is for documentary purposes. Are you hearing me okay? Yeah? Okay. <clears throat> I, I just want to highlight some of the other talks that we have. This is our third talk. Last week we had um, our talk on cervical health, and that was really good. And the first one was on menopause. That was really good as well. Next week, we will be talking about midwifery and gentle birth options. Following that, we will talk about pre and post exposure prophylaxis or treatment regimes um, available in Barbados, the successes of them. And for to start commemorate the 16 days of activism, we'll be having a talk on street sexual harassment. And the last one will be on vaginal steaming. And today, I'm really excited about this particular topic, um, and I'll tell you why. Our main objectives, really to look at how widespread uterine fibroids are in the Caribbean, and I find there's not enough conversations around, public conversations, shall I say, around uterine fibroids. And I'm sure if I ask each and every one of you, if you or someone you know has or had fibroids, if you could show by a raise of hands, let's see. Yeah, so almost everyone. 
knows. Um, someone who has had fibroids. And yet, we are not having enough of a conversation about fibroids and what the implications are. So we're going to look at some of these um, topics and then causes and possible prevention strategies and the symptoms of fibroids and then to advise on non-surgical procedural um, treatment. So just a little bit of a trigger warning, just because we are UWE Harp and we practice politics of inclusion. Um, this discussion is going to be quite cis-normative, meaning that we will focus today on cisgendered women, um, where your gender identity corresponds with the sex that you were born with. So I identify as a woman and I have female, I was born with female genitalia. We also want to acknowledge that there are other groups of women, uh, other groups of people, sorry, that have anatomical female bodies but do not identify as women. These include trans men and gender non-conforming people that may also experience fibroids and other gynecological complications. And this last two slides to show you, um, you can join us on the UWE app. Uh, we are located in the groups and clubs. You can get all of our activities, the flyers and notifications of what we're doing. We're all the way at the bottom. So you can just scroll down, you'll see UWE Harp and then join the club. And then you can find us in Sherlock Hall of Residence. And then this is our email. And then you can find us on Facebook and Instagram once you go in and look for UWE Harp Cave Hill. Right, so today I'm really pleased to invite Dr. Damien Best again to facilitate today's discussion. And he's been really, really supportive of our sexual health discussion series. This is his third with us. Dr. Best completed his undergraduate medical training at UE Cave Hill, class of 2005. He has been in exclusive practice of the specialty of obstetrics and gynecology for over 11 years with his postgraduate qualifications, including the UE Doctor of Medicine in Obstetrics and Gynecology 2012, member of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists 2012, and a Master of Science by Research from the University of Aberdeen 2016. This latter qualification was undertaken during his subspecialty fellowship in reproductive medicine at the Aberdeen Fertility Center, where he was trained over a two-year span, January 2015 to December 2016, in the management of infertile couples and in assisted con conception treatments, including in vitro fertilization, IVF, with certification from the British Fertility Society. He's currently a lecturer in, in obstetrics and gynecology at the UE Cave Hill and a consultant in obstetrics and gynecology in private practice and at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital where he's also in charge of an infertility clinic. His published research mainly surrounds fertility, particularly related to the effects of obesity. That's another one we're gonna to need to do, Dr. B. NCDs and sexual health. He has given many lectures and appearances related to endometriosis and PCOS throughout the island. I'd like you to join me in welcoming Dr. Best to the podium. Thank you, Dr. Best. Good afternoon, audience. First, we've got to decide if we know what fibroids really are. So what are fibroids? So fibroids are benign, meaning they're not cancer. I know they want to say tumors. Let's just say swellings, growth in the muscle wall of the uterus. Assuming you know what a uterus is, they tend to affect women of reproductive age. So just so we know it's a uterus first. So this represents a lady with pelvis. Yep. Same muscle, but we're seeing these little growths pushing against the muscle and growing in the walls of fibroid of the uterus. And they're called uterine fibroids or scientifically leomyomata. And they're fairly common as well. So they are the most common tumor that affects women, uh, occurring up to seven out of every 10 women. That could be higher if you're of black origin, trust me. So up to 70% of women, between starting their, their reproductive lifespan and ending it with menopause, will have a fibroid or more fibroids within their lifespan. We look 
home at our hospital, I did an audit in 2014, it was the most common thing in the clinic. Okay? I was looking for fertility problems and stuff. This is by far and away the most common thing that we were seeing in our clinic, uterine fibroids. And they usually come to us because they're having symptoms. A great majority of fibroids will not have any clinical features at all. So any one of you might have absolutely no features, no symptoms, no nothing going on, could have some fibroids, you don't know. So we think that perhaps we might be underestimating the true incidence of fibroids since most of them can actually be, you know, hide until such time, right? Symptoms can also develop quite slowly. When you do have symptoms, they tend to relate to how many fibroids, maybe how big they are, and certainly where they're located in this uterus. Remember, we did see a picture before of the uterus, uterine wall, and then it had the little fibroids in there. So fibroids can be located inside the uterus, right where your periods when they come out. We call those submucosal fibroids. And because that makes the inside of the uterus kind of objockey and you know not so smooth, those kind of submucous fibroids, even the ones that have a little stalk and stick into the uterus alone, pedunculated fibroids, which are a subset, can cause lots and lots of heavy periods. Submucous fibroids are the one that distort the lining, heavy periods. And those are the ones we also might associate with things sometimes like miscarriage and the ones that some people think might cause difficulty getting pregnant. Right? If they are exclusively in the wall of uterus, we call those fibroids intramural, so within the wall. Tend not to cause as many problems. But then these ones here that are sticking out, they can poke into your bladder and your rectum and stuff, and they can also cause pressure symptoms, right? So the most common, two common ways that fibroids present, if they do cause symptoms, are either going to be heavy periods or symptoms due to pressure from these fibroids. So bleeding, most common, due to these. And heavy bleeding can make you drop your blood counts. So you become anemic, right? And if you're anemic, sometimes if your hemoglobin is so low, you can start to get fatigue and heart racing and that kind of thing. And if the periods are heavy enough, you can also get pain during your periods, yeah? The pressure symptoms we mentioned, it depends again on which way the, the fibroids are pointing and how big they are. So if they press forward on your bladder, that disallows the amount of capacity the bladder has to expand. So you tend to go to the bathroom to pee more often. Or sometimes, if the bladder is tilted enough, you might not even be able to pee properly sometimes. We call that urinary retention. If they press backward against the rectum and that kind of thing, where stool obviously has to pass through, you can get constipation. But if you just have a big fibroid sitting in the bowl of the pelvis, you can get you know, some pelvic pressure. It feels heavy down there, right? Pain during sex, that kind of thing. Chronic pelvic pain, right? So this is just a cartoon, I guess, illustrating that. So here's a normal uterus. So in front of the uterus, it's the bladder. This was there to show that there's space for urine to come in there. This is the rectum back here, right? It's a little space between the uterus and the bladder. And the, sorry, the uterus and the rectum. What's this? That's not cool. So those fibroids, here this one is squishing that bladder, which really can't expand. So you can imagine a lot less peak and hole in there before she has to go to the bathroom again. But they're squishing the rectum, the stool can't pass through there again. That's constipation, constipating. And you can imagine the difficulty she may have during having sexual intercourse, right? Sometimes you might even be able to feel this if this is all up behind the, the tummy wall as a hard mass there in the pelvis. There's somebody else inside there. Yeah. So this basically I want to tell you about the effects of fibroids on pregnancy. So because seven out of 10 of our women can have fibroids, a lot of women do have pregnancy most of the time absolutely no problems, right? But sometimes they can cause problems in pregnancy. It's 
up for debate whether fibroids do cause you to not be able to get pregnant easily, infertility. I suppose, as I pointed out earlier, the ones that jack into the uterus, the submucous ones, probably are the culprits, if at all, all right? But up for debate, the ethnic intramural ones or sub serosal ones or do anything for fertility. Same ones, they suspect maybe sometimes might be associated with pregnancy loss. Again, unproven. They can be associated with obstetric problems. So you get pregnant, you're having a baby, yeah, right? Sometimes it can be painful, right? If they grow because estrogen causes them to grow, progesterone causes fibroids to grow. And in pregnancy, it's not just your natural progesterone, estrogen that's climbing, it's placenta's producing that in droves. So fibroids are growing and they might grow faster than the blood supply can catch up. If you think about that, if you're being starved of oxygen, that's going to hurt. Red degeneration of fibroids can occur during pregnancy, and that can be a painful condition. But bleeding after delivery, postpartum hemorrhage, happens because the uterus might be distorted and stuff and not able to contract to stop bleeding. Might more likely to have C-sections. Baby might not be able to turn as well because of the fibroids, so they might stay a breach for the bottom <laughs> down, right? Low birth weight babies, maybe if the percent is implanted over fibroid, that might compromise the blood supply, that kind of thing. So there could be problems with pregnancies, but most of the time, absolutely fine. All right? Yep. You recognize the light curtain, sir? This is just to show, again, some features that you might have that might suggest, hey, maybe I have fibroids. So bloating, passing water frequently, pain during the course, lower back pain, constipation, chronic genital discharge. Who gets fibroids? I'm looking around the room, and yeah, I'm sorry to say that black women, far away over other races, get more fibroids. Yeah, I said up to three times as likely. But I read a review last night that said up to nine times more likely. So somewhere between three and nine times more likely than Caucasians to get fibroids. And ours tends to be more multiple, bigger, etc. right? Age is the next risk factor. So again, it's estrogen, it's progesterone. So the more cycles you have in your lifetime, where estrogen's climbing and stuff, and the less time you spend pregnant, for example, right? Or on the pill or that kind of thing, the more cycles you have, the more you're likely you have fibroids, and the more they are to grow, and the more to be multiple, and the more to be big, all right? So family history too. There seems to be some sort of genetic link. Hence are white, I guess, black people have them more often. Pregnancies, as I said, because the less cycles you're having, they tend to seem to reduce fibroids risk. So not the symptoms, remember we said a red degeneration thing, but it tends to reduce the risk. The more times you're pregnant, and some people are surprised by this, if you're on the pill or the injection, that actually reduces your risk of fibroids. Yeah? Epidemiological evidence has shown. All right? One Japanese study has suggested that there is increased risk of fibroids with hypertension. Five times increase. And some Chinese studies have suggested that there's also some sort of dietary risk associated with things like soy. I guess it might have it more of the natural estrogens, right? That like you get in peanuts and stuff, phytoestrogens. Soy, bean milk, sweetened and preserved foods and stuff. And red meat, I suppose, can have it more estrogen as well, right? Especially if they're pumping them full of steroids. So that might be a risk factor for the fibroids. I won't tell anybody if you want, caffeine and alcohol seem to have increased association as well with fibroids. And again, because of this whole estrogen link, obesity, because body fat produces a type of estrogen as well. So the more body fat you carry, the more impetus, estrogen impetus you have for fibroids to grow. All right? So far, so good. So we've said what fibroids are. They are benign growths in the wall 
or muscle wall of the uterus. It can be submucosal, intramural, subserosal, pedunculated. Depending on where they are, they can cause different symptoms. They might not cause symptoms at all, but pressure on the bladder with frequent urine, pressure on the rectum with constipation, pelvic congestion with deep dyspareunia, that's pain during intercourse, pelvic, chronic pelvic pain. And we talked about some risk factors, mainly seated in estrogen, progesterone, and more cycles. Although, estrogen containing OCPs, less risk. Depo Provera, less risk. Go away from your processed sweetened foods. Keep the red meat down, keep the soy down. So how do we diagnose that? Well, based on your symptoms, really, it could be a first indicator. I would say by far and away, maybe we are even blinded by the fact that in our black women, this is very common, that people present with heavy periods, painful periods, we kind of say five words not to prove in other ways, right? Even though we know the other differentials. But symptoms are the first clue. They might be found, of course, and or confirmation might take place during a pelvic examination, right? So uterus usually is a small something. It's not easily felt on the tummy. But if you can feel it in tummy, clearly that's something bigger there, potentially fibroid uterus. An ultrasound would usually clinch the diagnosis for us, and that is the gold standard for di diagnosis of gynecological problems. And newer techniques in using transvaginal ultrasound with some saline inside the uterus. Remember, we showed a uterine cavity before. If you inject some saline in there, those little pedunculated fibroids, pedunculated subserosal fibroids can jut into there, and we can pick those up like this. So that's the uterus. And we put some saline, some water in there, and a little fibroid there poking out. And these are the ones we prefer to remove if you're having problems getting pregnant or you're having heavy periods as a result. Next, I'm going to show you an MRI. MRI stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging. It gives pretty good sharp images of gynecology. Probably better than ultrasound in some cases. Kind of expensive, doesn't use any x-rays. And this is a normal uterus, right? A nice pear-shaped organ, nice and smooth. This looks beautiful. This, not so much. <laughs> this, fibroids, yes? And obviously, squishing the blood of this one here. Yeah, fibroids, pretty, pretty serious. So a lot of them are asymptomatic, so no symptoms. Those are symptoms. We try to treat the symptoms. We make the symptoms better, yeah? So the treatment, of course, will depend on the actual symptoms. So heavy bleeding, we treat heavy bleeding. Pain, we treat pain. The size, the number, the position, whether the patient want to undergo surgery. I know we want to lean more on the non-surgical stuff today, but we will talk a bit about surgery. But certainly their plans for future fertility will play a, a massive role, right? Because you can imagine that we can stop bleeding, but with contraceptive methods. Or we can take all the fibroids out of the uterus, but then obviously they can't get pregnant in the future. So we have to take all of these things into account when we're planning, planning a management plan for a patient with fibroids. So first we talk a bit about how we manage heavy bleeding. So this thing, this device here, kind of shaped like a T. It's not a proper T. It's what we call a levonorgestrel intrauterine system. Ask your doctor if Myrina is right for you. <laughs> <laughs> Side effects may include them. Right. So that is a Myrina device. I'm not supposed to use trade names, so that's why I said levonorgestrel intrauterine system, LNG, IUS. All right? So levonorgestrel is a hormone. It's a progestogen. Yeah? So we said fibroids have progestogen receptors. They also have some in the lining of the human uterus, the endometrium. So some people take progestogens to stop their period because eventually it thins out this lining. So if we can get that lining to thin out by putting the progesterone right there, then we can decrease the amount of bleeding, right? 
So that's the idea behind using this levonorgestrel intrauterine system. Put hormone right there to thin out that lining so there's not that so much bleeding. And some science, some evidence has shown that that might even shrink these fibroids a little bit because the natural progesterone not affecting them, that blocks those progesterone receptors, the fibroids can, might, might actually shrink a little bit. There's some studies that said that. So that brings me on to the topic of you can shrink the fibroids, which a lot of people ask you. I mean to say shrink, right? But they to say shrink. <laughs> if you ever heard that one, you can shrink the fibroids. Yes, you can shrink fibroids, but guess what? Anything that you do to try to shrink fibroids is temporary. As soon as you stop that method, they're going to grow back. Especially medications. Here are some examples. So this is probably the most common example of shrinking fibroids. <laughs> shrinking fibroids that you might hear of. And we do this in order to make surgery easier actually. All right? So you got maybe some big some mucous fibroids or something and you're bleeding a lot, we want to stop it. You want to shrink the fibroids to make surgery easier, make, maybe make cuts salt smaller. We can give you an injection. Something like Lupron or Zoladex. And what these do is they shut off the pituitary, the little gland at the base of the brain that causes your cycle to go on, right? So you know what it's going to do? It's going to put you in temporary menopause, actually. Yeah. So no estrogen, no fiber growth, isn't it? So we're smart. Science. We science our way out of it, but that means that you're going to get menopause symptoms. <laughs> no, don't, don't laugh. Don't laugh. Don't make me laugh. You get menopause symptoms for the six months maximum that you're allowed to use this. And we cut out six months because your bones also will become sort of menopausal, so will become more brittle thin, right? So if we're gonna go more six months, you need to get some estrogen back. So yes, we can shrink the fibroids with injections. It's useful for preparing for surgery, but we gotta stop sometime and the fibroids can grow back. So, we got more science now. Unipristal acetate. I love saying these big words in front of the persons. They're like, mm hmm? Ask your doctor if Esmaya is right for you. <laughs> so they did some huge multi center trials called PEARL trials that show that this thing shrinks fibroids, right? You take either five milligram or 10 milligram daily up to 13, 12, 13 weeks, because you can't go longer than that, apparently. You can take a break of a month in between. But you can take this for 12, 13 weeks, and you shrink fibroids, right? Without all of those side effects that Lupron and Zoradex has, so now they have flashes and stuff, it's not estrogen dropping because it actually blocks progesterone receptors. Armstrong had it for a little bit, Armstrong agencies. I checked today, because I didn't talk, you all might ask me. If they have it still, they don't have it now. <laughs> Apparently, the FDA has some sort of tussle about it, right? But it seems to be one for the future that can shrink fibroid again, probably planning for surgery or something, at least temporarily until such time, right? But you're probably going to stop it at some point, and the fibroids will grow back probably a bit longer, it's supposed to be about six, maybe 12 months until the fibroids will regrow, but they will probably grow back. The uterine artery embolization. <laughs> so the uterine artery is the main blood supply going to the uterus. So some smart person recognized that if you block the blood supply to the fibroids, you know what happened to them? They will shrink. <laughs> right? They need oxygen and stuff. So you, they go through the femoral artery and they put these little particles into the uterine artery, the ones that are feeding the fibroid, and that blocks off the blood supply. So they starved of everything, blood supply, the fibroids can shrink. And this actually could be pretty good for managing symptoms from fibroids. So what are the drawbacks and why people don't do this much, right? Well, I suppose it requires specialist expertise, interventional radiology. 
it has shorter return to work, you know, it's upper, faster recovery, less major, major complications, a few more minor complications though, jam discharge and so on, and pain in the early period afterwards. But I think that the major drawback is that yes, eventually you can get fibroid regrowth, probably takes a while, a year or two years, and more people than those who actually get surgery come back asking for surgery. High rate of subsequent surgery. So yes, it seems to be pretty, pretty promising. Less effective for very big fibroids, of course, because they will take more time to shrink. Pain can be happen post-op because of the starvation of the fibroids. A high rate of subsequent surgery. I mentioned MRI before. So the new kid on the block is MRI guided high intensity focused ultrasound, HIFU. <laughs> HIFU, <laughs> all right? <laughs> so HIFU, MRI, this kind of chamber here, that kind of looks claustrophobic, doesn't it? That's why a lot of people complain about the MRIs. So that is meant to guide you to find the fibroid. Probably the one fibroid, if you got a one fibroid, it's a nice Caucasian lady. Right, nice one small fibroid, right? <laughs> that you can shrink with heat focused ultrasound to the center of the fibroid to cause it to basically die off in the process, right? The shrinkage and improvement of the six to 12 months, yeah. But not, not useful for large fibroids though. <laughs> if you got one fibroid, yes, but multiple fibroids probably not so useful. The pedunculated fibroids, you kind of probably don't want to do that because if they die, they might fall off into your body and you might still need surgery. <laughs> So yes, it can shrink fibroids. And there are ways to do that, but they're probably gonna grow back. And you probably might want surgery. So I think the take home here is, probably try to fix your diet and so on, you know, so less of these processed foods and the stuff that will have, you know, estrogens and so on, red meat. I guess, I don't want to say get pregnant more, but <laughs> you know, birth control and stuff, protective. You can manage your symptoms medically, you know, in terms of using devices and that kind of thing to decrease the amount of bleeding. But if you have pressure symptoms, a lot of the shrinkage modalities can work, but they might be temporary and you might still need surgery at the end of the day. Okay? So I hope that's not a bugaboo to anybody. I wanted to introduce the surgical elements for managing fibroids. So again, you have to consider whether the woman wants pregnancy in the future or not. Because we are removing fibroid tissue or tissue recontaining fibroids, it's more definitive, meaning it probably not go back. But of course, obviously it's surgery, so it's more invasive. So you have to pour into the woman's body. Fertility sparing surgery, basically removing fibroids and leaving the womb so you can still get future pregnancies, is termed myomectomy. And the ways we can do myomectomy are laparotomy, which means opening up the tummy to go in there and take fibroids out, or laparoscopy, which means trying to use smaller keyholes, cameras, a scope, in order to do surgery using those little tiny ports, probably dissecting up the fibroids, they call it morselation, to pull that out through smaller ports. So the woman requires others faster, all right? Also, remember the submucous fibroids, submucous fibroids, submucosal fibroids that are inside the womb can be removed through cameras going into the womb hysteroscopically. So that's myomectomy. Hysterectomy is removing the uterus with all the fibroids. And of course, that does not spear anyone's fertility. Right? As much as the Swedish people are doing uterine transplants yet, trust me, we have a while before that reaches us down here in the Caribbean. So this is just to illustrate what open myomectomy or laparotomy for myomectomy will look like. And yeah, so patients often say, you can't just remove the fibroids when you're recommending hysterectomy. But this is illustrative. Of, it's not just that straightforward, right? Because hysterectomy, you're you're dissecting ligaments and blood vessels and you're taking out everything. For 
each fibroid or each set of fibroids you have for myometomy, you have to cut into the uterine wall and the muscle, shell out the fibroid, and then stitch all of that back, right? For each fibroid, right? So you can imagine that this here could have quite a bit of blood loss, quite a bit of scar on the outside of the uterus. Adhesions and stuff, scar tissue can form. No guarantees. And if for some reason something goes wrong during a myomectomy, our recourse is to take you for so hysterectomy. Alright? Because we can't allow you to bleed if it's life threatening, if that makes sense. Alright? So I usually give patients this analogy, right? Hard boiled egg. You have a hard boiled egg, you have white, you have yolk. So you're going to cut into the white, shell out that yolk, right? They might be stuck in there, so you might want to. You know, hold it with an instrument and stuff, and tease it out with like, some stuff or whatever. And then, you gotta close back all that, because otherwise blood gonna collect in there, right? So you gotta close back in that space that yolk was, close back together the way. I'll probably close back the shell after, because that's the skin, right? <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> all right. So yeah, this is after multiple myomectomy, right? So imagine how many times you got cut in, take out fibroid, stitch back, yeah. All right, so usually if you can get um, the incision, I get enough fibroids out through one incision, great. I hope you don't have to take out too many too deep because sometimes um, if you go into the lining and the mitrium, well, I suppose it is not a terrible thing because it, it just means that you have to have a cesarean section if you do become pregnant in the future because that's a potential point of weakness for labor, all right? So yeah, my myomectomy. So this is that, uh, so that anybody is not familiar with laparoscopy, you know that fibroids are also done laparoscopically. So this is a camera through the belly button, you know, some operation ports through the side. And the tummy is filled with carbon dioxide so that it's distended and you can see, so it's a light source. And you can take the fibroids out like that. Obviously, trying to do it with instruments, rather do it with your hands, right? You're trying to do it over here. So. All right, tricky, more technical, takes longer, but the benefit of that is faster recovery, less blood loss, etc. okay? And this is to illustrate the hysteroscopic ones. So if you have a, the submucous fibroids, they're, they're sticking into the uterine cavity, and you have a hysteroscope, a uh, receptoscope, they call that, with some uh, diathermy, some heat, and a sharp edge here, that can basically shave off the fibroid. Right? Yes? So it's going in and out. Can you see that? So it's basically shaving off the fibroid until it's gone, until it's flat and flush. Right? A receptacle. Pretty cool, isn't it? Oh, sorry. So a fibroid being like this, taking up the entire uterus, this is huge. Look at the surgeon's hands compared to the size of this. So you can notice a massive something. In our Caribbean fibroids. Very often look like that. Um, so this will probably need a hysterectomy <laughs> rather than a myomectomy because I don't think that there's much uterus you can save after struggling with that. Um, hysterectomies, if you're doing an open surgery laparotomy, if they're small enough, so under the navel, you can probably do a little bikini line cut. Cool. She will never know the difference. You know, she's like, oh. I had a great surgery, you know, because it, 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 it's hidden, it's, it's well hidden, right? She wouldn't even know that we went through all that stress to take off the fibroids, right? Bigger uterus might need a vertical incision because that can be extended, so it gives us more room. And for younger women, we would tend to just take the uterus in a total hysterectomy, meaning we would take the muscle of the uterus along with the cervix. I preserve for them the ovaries, which produce the hormones which you need for protecting your bones and your libido and your heart and everything, right? Um, older women that perhaps already in menopause, the ovaries can come out at the same time with the fallopian tubes. We call that salping ovarectomy, right? Radical hysterectomies are for cervical cancer. I don't know why I put that there, <laughs> right? But that's what hysterectomy is all about. And hysterectomy can be done open like that. For those huge fibroids, it can also be done laparoscopic if it's a bit smaller. 
or vaginal hysterectomy. All right. So in summary, thank you for staying awake. Thank you for staying with us throughout this talk. Fibroids are pretty common. Seven out of every 10 women between first period and last will have uterine fibroids at some point in their life. And as age goes on, the incidence in increases and they're particularly common among black women, right? Many of them will be asymptomatic. Like I said, plenty of women walking around don't even have a clue they have fibroids. So they come to the office, you scan them, like, oh, I have a fibroid? That's great. But when you do have symptoms, it depends on where the fibroids are located, the numbers, the size, etc. The treatment, again, based on the symptoms they're having, you want to target those, and also considering their desired future fertility, or current fertility, rather, as well. Both medical and surgical options are available. Remember, medical is mostly to stop bleeding and so on. If you try to shrink the fibroids, they're probably going to go back after you stop the treatment. Surgical so options would include removing the fibroids, again with the main aim of preserving uterus for fertility, or removing the uterus. The techniques which are used will depend on local expertise as well, the benefits and the risks individualized to the woman. And I think that is it. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? No? Great. I just want to thank all of you for coming today. And before you go, I need you to complete your evaluation forms and turn it into Keely, who's at the front. And I especially would like to thank uh, Dr. Bess for supporting us and coming out and giving his knowledge and sharing his knowledge with us. And I'd like you all to help me thank him by giving him a hand. And don't forget, please um, make any recommendations on topics you would like to hear. I'd also like to thank EMS for filming and taking photos today. And of course, I'd like to thank Kelia um, from our office for helping me again. And hopefully we'll see you at some of the other talks. Um, we're going until the 29th of November. Thank you and take care. <laughs>